Welcome to the Monday morning introduction to philosophy and theory lecture. My name is Julian. This is the live in New York City edition. Um, you can't really tell, but right outside is the uh, Empire State Building. You can actually see it from my window. We are in Lower Manhattan today, having a wonderful, wonderful Easter weekend. I hope that you're having a wonderful Easter weekend wherever you are. So greetings from me in New York City. I'm very, very happy to be here. And if you're wondering what's up, basically for the next 45 minutes or so, I'm gonna be hosting a introductory lecture to some key ideas about freedom within continental theory and philosophy, emphasizing specifically Slavoj Žižek's theory of freedom as feigned necessity versus the uh, necessity of obligation. That's very abstract, but it's something I'm gonna explain in more detail. If you're new to this project, my name is Julian. I used to work as an educator and academic at the University of Oxford Brooks. When the pandemic hit, I decided to start live streaming my classes for free on the internet, open access for anyone to join. We originally started with a group of, I think, six or eight students who I all knew in person. Um, but in the year since this project, which I've continued to do every single Monday for the past three years, has ballooned into a global community of like-minded learners. And I'm so grateful that you're here. Um, my dream, I've said this before, my dream is to make open access education available to everyone and anyone. I really, really believe that anyone can benefit from some basic knowledge of philosophy and so-called continental theory and psychoanalysis, and that it makes the world a more lively and rich place to be in, to understand and see and analyze the world through those conceptual frameworks. And so my dream, my mission, my project is to bring those ideas to you, the viewer, in a way that is hopefully accessible and entertaining. However, if you'd like to support me in my project, if you'd like to help me keep these classes open access for anyone, please do consider making a donation to my Patreon. We have a very lively community on Patreon where I post a Q&A after each and every lecture that we record live together on Discord. You can download my ebook. It's an ebook subscription service that renews every three months. Basically, after every lecture series, I release an accompanying ebook, usually about 100 pages or so, in case you miss some of the classes. The current ebook is called Spurious Infinities, The Cultural Logic of Post-Postmodernism. So if you decide to support me in this project, you have not only helped me, but you've also helped the students around the world who participate in these classes for free. Plus, there's a whole bunch of perks that you can access. Thank you to our patrons who continue to keep this project alive. If you'd like to become a patron, please go to www.patreon.com forward slash Janeline and Julian. That's www.patreon.com forward slash Janeline and Julian. I'll also post the link in the description and you can find it on my bio on Instagram. Okay, so I'm gonna pick up where I left off last week. Last week, we ended on Zizek's paradoxical theory about freedom. And one thing that I didn't mention last week is that it's really Zizek's adaptation of a Spinozian theory of freedom. For Spinoza, freedom is essentially um, uh, 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 any free act is essentially a necessity realized as freedom. The example that Zizek uses, where we ended last week, is that you could imagine that a person passes out on the street and everybody walks by. Nobody wants to help or intervene. And yet you decide to act. You decide to be the one person who intervenes and calls an ambulance. Later, a local news reporter asks you, why is it that you intervened when nobody else would? What made you the hero? Well, likely you would respond, the reason I acted as I did is because I had no other choice. Of course I had to act. Here we have the Spinozian conception of freedom as realized necessity. And Zizek's twist on this is to say that it's not just that freedom is realized necessity. In other words, a sense of, I couldn't have acted any differently. But freedom is feigned necessity. In other words, that any truly free act relies upon the, the feigning, the faking, if you will, of something that you couldn't have done otherwise. 
Think about certain creatives who say something like, well, I invented this thing because it was inevitable that someone was going to invent it, so it might as well have to be me. This retroactive positing or framing of your own act, which was thereby genuinely creative, as simply being some kind of historical necessity, is not only a form of false modesty, it is the realization of freedom as the embrace or the feigning of necessity. Now, what I'm going to do in this lecture today is I'm going to try to look at the inverse of this. Another way of saying that is we're going to look at the opposite of it. Zizek essentially argues, and this is really key, that if freedom is feigned necessity, that civil behavior, politesse, civic society, the rule of uh, the, the, the world of rules and norms that we inhabit is therefore its exact opposite. It is freedom passed off as obligation. Oh, by the way, I should very quickly say, I saw someone in the comments saying hello from Pakistan, and I'm so self-centered today, I didn't even ask to ask where you guys are joining me from. I was all, I'm in New York, and I'm so special, but please do let me know in the comments where you are joining me from today. I love seeing where you're joining us from. I saw someone from Pakistan. Uh, I really appreciate hearing where you guys are from, and I'm happy to do a little shout out. I love that we're so connected. I was just excited to get to the class today. Hello to Frankfurt. Hello to Frankfurt, New Jersey, Channel Islands, Mexico. That's incredible. Romania, hello Romania. I'd love to go to Romania someday, as I would like to go to Mexico. Germany, guten Morgen Deutschland, or guten Nachmittag. Barcelona, China, Utrecht. I used to study in Utrecht, actually. It's a wonderful university and a beautiful library. Slovenia, Amman, Jordan, that's incredible. Poland, that's wonderful. Thank you guys so much, I really appreciate you. Okay, so back to the topic of this lecture. Last week, we ended on Zizek's take on the Spinozian concept of freedom. The Spinozian concept of freedom is freedom as realized necessity. Zizek says that it is actually, more precisely, freedom as feigned or faked necessity. A necessary gesture which you inhabit, to put it in the terms of the philosopher Alain Badieu, you hear the siren call of an event and you have loyalty or fidelity to the event. You see your own subjective agency made manifest in the opportunity that is presented to you. You step into that contingency and retroactively present it as a necessity. That is, that is freedom from a Zizekian perspective. And Zizek juxtaposes this with the idea of civility as being a freedom, a free act, which is presented as an obligation. And this is not just a part of civic society, this is also part of what we might see within political correctness, that you speak in a certain way and you say you have to, you have a moral obligation to speak this way and you present it as your own free choice to have done so, so as to pre prevent hurting the other person's feelings. But on a more minor note, any civic interaction requires this free act feigned as necessity. For example, let's say that um, you are picking up somebody from the airport. They've just arrived at the airport and you're really busy and you don't really want to pick them up. But you also feel like if you don't pick them up, then that would be considered rude. It would signal to the other person that you don't really, you're not really happy to see them. And so despite having better things to do, you go to the airport to pick them up. Then they'll probably say something like, oh, I'm so glad that you picked me up. And you'll respond, of course I picked you up. I had no choice. Like, I want to see you so badly. Of course I picked you up. Here we have exactly how all civic society works, which is to say that it's essentially a free act, a free choice, that is presented as an obligation. Oh, I had to pick you up. Now, what's key here is that this doesn't make civic society fake, and yet part of what makes civil society work is precisely that there is a certain false or feigned element to it. After all, one of the, imagine when two people meet each other and they say, how are you? The, the most common response is to reply, I'm good, how are you? The, Invitation, or the question, how are you, isn't necessarily an invitation to truly tell the other person how you're doing. Let's say that you've just had the worst day of your life. You're very unlikely to share this information to a, strange, uh, to a friend, let alone to a stranger. Now, 
This doesn't make us stunted. This doesn't make us somehow morally inept. Instead, this is the very basis upon which civic society rests, a kind of necessary politeness by which we interact that allows a symbolic structure to exist that is thereby inauthentic. Now, what's key here is that this inauthenticity is precisely the kernel of the truth that is located within all power. For example, we, we talked about this last week. The Lacanian, or maybe we didn't, Lacan has this beautiful expression, which he calls uh, uh, the non-duped are fooled, or the non-duped are duped. My French is terrible, but it's les non-dupes uh, c'est errant. Les, les, les non-dupes c'est errant. Please correct me. And essentially, you can imagine it like this. You walk into a courtroom, and you are being judged in a courtroom by the judge. And you could say in your defense... Something like, who are you to judge me? After all, you're wearing a wig, and you're behind, the, you have the gavel, you wield the gavel, and yet fundamentally we're just two human beings. How do you think that you are better than me, that you get to cast judgment on me? This would be the naive, realistic assumption. A kind of universal positing of human experience, which makes the judge equal to the criminal, or perhaps not the criminal, the person being judged. Of course, you can already see here that how the central principle within Foucault's analysis within discipline and punish is precisely to point out the arbitrary nature of this interrelationship, and yet precisely not to point out that we are simply all human beings, that all structures of power are thereby fake. Foucault's insight is precisely to say that it is the arbitrary nature of these power relations that makes them so powerful. In this sense, there's a similarity between Lacan's idea that the non-duped are duped and the Foucauldian idea of discipline and punish. Now, what does Lacan mean by the non-duped are duped? Essentially, what Lacan means is that the person who walks in naively and says, I am not taken in by the halls of power. I am not taken in by the gavel. I'm not taken in by the wig that you wear. You have no authority over me. That person for Lacan is precisely the idiot. The idiot who doesn't see that true power resides precisely in false symbols, not human symbols. It's like you go into a church and you see a relic. The, the, the naive person would say, oh, this is just a bone. It means nothing. From a Lacanian perspective, it's precisely because it's just a bone that it means everything. All the symbolic psychological energy of the faith becomes imbued within this material remainder of that which cannot be properly symbolized. Hence also why when you look at monarchies, the symbol of the crown isn't simply about the overt oppression of the monarch. It is precisely this empty, therefore master signifier, that allows everything else to come into fruition. If you go, for example, in the United Kingdom to what is claimed to be the world's oldest think tank, namely Chatham House, when you go to Chatham House, which is a members-only, invitation-only uh, 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 organization, in the very front row of every event, you will see people who are the representatives of the crown, who are dressed in regalia, similar to what you might see in Vatican City. Now, the representatives of the crown aren't there to directly influence <clears throat> public or international policy. They are there to provide the umbrella of legitimacy under which the think tank or from which the think tank derives its authority. Now, of course, the naive person, like the Lacan's duped, is the person who would walk in and would say, well, this authority of the king means nothing. Clearly, he has no impact on public policy. When the opposite is, of course, true. If the very institution exists under the principle that it is sanctioned by the monarch, then it cannot do anything that would structurally or systematically undermine the power of the monarch without therefore undermining itself. And that is the manner in which symbolic power becomes institutionalized, not by the direct overt control of the powerful, but precisely by the empty signifier of those symbols of authority that become retroactively filled in by the institutions around it. Therefore, <clears throat> we can also see that when Lacan says that the big other doesn't exist, it's precisely the inexistence of the big other, the absence of a material reality of the big other that makes it real, that requires the necessity of sustaining it through material institutional power structures. 
In other words, the big other doesn't exist because the big other is always already filled in by its own non-existence. Now, of course, if you're new to philosophy, this may seem like a whole lot of dialectical nonsense. So <clears throat> let's take a step back and try to fill this in a little bit more. Fundamentally, all polites, all participation in civic society rests upon this foundational principle that you, that you therefore present your own free act, an act of free will, as one of necessity. For example, on a very basic level, if someone says, could you please pass the salt? Of course, you don't have to pass the salt, and yet you choose to pass the salt, but you participate in it in a kind of blind, not knowing mechanism. Of course, I pass the salt to you since you have asked. This is a social custom that we have. You ask me to pass the salt, I will pass you the salt. Fundamentally, you have therefore undertaken what is a free act, a free act to participate in an unfree structure. And the paradox is that this unfree structure is precisely liberating. From a Hegelian perspective, even from a Kantian perspective, this is how civic society works. We participate in, a, in an enormous amount of unspoken and spoken rules, norms, regulations that create the background or the horizon of our own freedom to participate in the world. This is also Zizek's critique of the American conception of freedom. Jizek says that the zero-sum conception of freedom as an absolute good fundamentally misunderstands what Hegel would have called the unity of opposites. The unity of opposites by which you can only access or tap into your freedom once you have given in to a whole subset of fundamental unfreedoms. Things you're not allowed to do, things that you cannot do, social contracts that you have implicitly participated in. Hence also why one of the aristocratic gestures that persists today in a supposedly classless United States is the idea of immunity from the law. Think about Trump's famous braggadocious moment where he said that he could go down Fifth Avenue and shoot somebody and that there would be no consequences. This overt statement, which Adorno would have called a a, uh, a, a, a dishonest lie, in other words, something that is stated specifically to prove that you can say anything, I'll explain that in a moment, is therefore today the, 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 the true demonstration of aristocratic power. Too big to fail is another example of this. Too big to fail means that you are in essentially so big that if someone were to punish you, that it would in inevitably punish the entire system. That your very failure becomes a kind of necessary feature of the continuing function of late stage capitalism. Of course, the reference here is to the banking system within the United States, which of course is integrally connected to the banking system of the entire world. And so Zizek's argument thereby is that civic society is on the one hand, the embrace of a certain amount of unfreedoms, things that you don't want to do, things that you don't like to acknowledge make you unfree, that thereby allow you to tap into the many freedoms that you have, the right to participate in society, to speak freely, and so on and so forth. Now, what's important here is that freedom versus unfreedom are not two antithetical propositions. Instead, from a Hegelian perspective, freedom thereby emerges from, if you will, the soil of unfreedom. That the participation in a coordinative collective organization, in other words, society, which thereby imposes rules and regulations upon your being and your behavior, is the precondition for the very idea of freedom and action to emerge. On a more metaphysical level, that freedom is therefore the realization of necessity, that you feel like you had to act in a certain way, which occurs against the backdrop of civic society, which is a free act which is presented as an obligation. Pass the salt? Of course I will pass the salt. You do things freely, you buy into them, because you feel like there is no other way for you to act. Now we can actually go back to Zizek's interpretation of the Bartlebyian maxim, <clears throat> I would prefer not to, excuse me, <clears throat> I would prefer not to, rather than simply being a refusal to participate, is therefore for Zizek the affirmation of a non-predicate, namely not I don't want to do it, but I would prefer not to do it. Therefore, the free assumption of an act of negation is the starting ground for a kind of rupture or gap within the symbolic order as such. Brief aside, I see a comment that says, I want to read Less Than Nothing. That is a very good impulse. Less Than Nothing is a very good book. 
on uh, Slavoj Žižek's theory, uh, on his theory of Hegel. In fact, a, a funny aside for a moment is that Žižek had said that he originally wanted the book, Less Than Nothing, to be called Epor Si Move, and Yet It Moves, which is also going to be the title of this series. Anyway, all that aside, I'm going to give you, give you a couple of examples of this un, the manner in which we participate in obligation that are presented to us as our own free will, and that this is how power is structured or located. I recently saw King Lear, the play. There's a beautiful example of this in King Lear. In King Lear, it essentially begins with King Lear having his daughters come to him to present to him their fidelity, their love, that they are loyal to him. Of course, the way in which this is staged is not unlike the scene from a couple of years ago where Trump hosted a cabinet meeting specifically for the purpose of having all the cabinet representatives swear their loyalty to him. Not in direct terms of an oath, but by means of coming up with increasingly colorful ways of telling him how wonderful he is. Something similar happens in King Lear. In King Lear, we have the king, the, 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 uh, the patriarch, the, the uh, authoritarian figure who invites his daughters, thereby demanding of them, of course, that they participate seemingly of their own volition, to affirm their love for him so that he can bestow upon them his grace and gratitude, giving them titles and honors and allowing them to marry. In other words, the fundamental gesture of participation within the power structure that is presented in King Lair, namely the monarchy, is to feign your own free expression of loyalty to the king. After all, if it were a directly authoritarian expression, you have to say that you love me, the thing would fall apart. It relies upon the participation in the system as an obligation that is presented as your own free will. In other words, a free act that follows the code of what has already been determined to be your preferred action. This means that when the three daughters arrive, the first two daughters come up with very colorful Shakespearean ways of expressing their undying love to King Lear. Of course, because this is feigned, because this is a kind of necessary oratorical device, that shows loyalty to the king, it means that, strictly speaking, it rings hollow. Here we already have one of the key themes within King Lear, which is the division of the paternal authority within the monarchical power authority. In order to swear loyalty to the king, they have to act in a manner by which the paternal authority seems to be undermined, namely in a way that is overly sentimental and dramatic. The third daughter, and this is of course the key starting point of the tragedy that is King Lear, the third daughter has a very Kantian response to the king. She says, he says, what can you say to me to prove how much you love me? And her response is nothing. There is nothing that I can say that will truly prove my love for you that hasn't already been said by my sisters. Now, on the one hand, the reason this is Kantian and relates to the Kantian sublime is that essentially what she's saying is true, which is that if I were to feign my love for you as my sisters have feigned it for you, it will thereby no longer be true love. It will be the feigned necessity of, loyal obli uh, of royal obligation. And so what the youngest sister says is to say, I cannot say anything about how much I love you. That is how much I love you. The reason that this is part of the Kantian sublime as opposed to the Burkean sublime, to repeat very briefly, the Burkean sublime, to simplify, is the idea that we have an absolute uh, sublimity, an essence, a kind of divinity, from which we have a trickle-down experience by which, for example, beauty that exists on Earth is simply the manifestation of a kind of divine beauty. And so everything exists in the world, like the love that you have for your friend or your partner is thereby simply a mirror image or, or projection of a divine love that exists. This is similar to the Platonic conception of the copy of a copy. A poem or a work of art is therefore already a copy of what was already a copy of the divine essence, the pure form. Within the Kantian sublime, rather than having this trickle-down economy by which the sublime is absolute and then finds particular manifestations or mirrors, copies within the world, instead the sublime exists within that which cannot be represented 
through its own formal content. To make that less abstract, here we have the problem that we have in King Lear. When the daughter says, I cannot tell you how much I love you, for to tell you how much I love you would already render my pure love impure. In other words, it has found expression in an impure means, namely the feigning of loyalty to the king. She therefore is essentially making an argument that is about the Kantian sublime. My love is sublime, Therefore, the very act of trying to represent it to you thus would undermine it from within. King Lear, of course, not being a Kantian philosopher, takes offense. He essentially says, well, from nothing comes nothing. If you can only tell me that your love is nothing, namely something that cannot be represented to me, thereby you have given me offense. And here we have, of course, the beginning of King Lear's tragedy, which is the division between the paternal authority and the monarchical authority. The paternal authority would be the daughter saying, I love you as a father, which means I cannot love you as a king. But what the king demands is to be loved as a king and a father, which of course is impossible. You can love someone either as a king or as a father. After all, the king demands loyalty by necessity, whereas the father demands loyalty by, if you will, a certain sentimentality. Now, what happens, of course, and this is something that we can see, I'll give you some more examples. What happens within King Lair is that this beginning, this nothing from nothing comes nothing, becomes a trap for King Lair essentially, because now everybody who has sworn loyalty to the king inherently becomes suspect. Everybody who has said, I love you, there falls into the trap that Lacan already wrote about, which is that I love you is the most, do you love me is the most dangerous question in the world. The king therefore knows that all of his subjects participate of their own volition in an unfree demonstration of their loyalty. Thereby, to be alone at the top, as it were, is to suspect that everybody loves you, in quotation marks, simply because you are a king. Therefore, the essence of the expression of genuine or true affection becomes impure or impossible. It becomes tainted. It's a little bit like a celebrity who says, or a rich person who says, I can no longer determine if people love me for myself or for my money. Of course, from a Lacanian perspective, the irony, again, the non-duped are duped, is precisely the insistence that there would be a division between the real you and the moneyed you. King Lear, therefore, falls into the psychotic madness of trying to find the authentic, universal condition of humankind, which, of course, is rendered a kind of paradoxical farce because he himself, as king, is the living embodiment of the material substance, which is the master signifier, a.k.a. the big other. In other words, the king is a kind of walking, living corpse who is therefore seeking his own human universal. This is what Zizek has termed symptomatic universality. Essentially, symptomatic universality is the insistence on a kind of universal participation of existence that underneath the surface is simply the masquerading or obfuscation of a certain pre-existing power structure. It's a classic Marxist argument. For example, the insistence on human rights, something that Hannah Arendt already criticized, the insistence on human rights is, of course, always spoken from the privileged position of a mostly well-to-do, middle-class, upper-middle-class, a white population that will almost never have to be in a position by which they have to insist upon their human rights. The idea of a universal human rights, whilst being morally and ethically normatively good in nature, is therefore precisely something that is spoken by the people who are obfuscating the underlying truth of pre-existing inequalities and the more important right that is guaranteed for that class, which is the, uh, which is the right of property ownership. Therefore, if you will, we have property ownership as being the subjective particular rights of the, of the well-to-do class versus the universal human rights of the non-property owning dispossessed class of global international refugees. Again, we have here human rights as a symptomatic universal, the insistence of a kind of universal gesture by which humanity can be framed, which obfuscates an underlying inequality or tension that is distinctly not universal, namely entirely particular. Hence also, for an aside, for those of you who are interested in Marxism, the Marxist analysis of class is precisely always to argue that the working class is the universal come particular.
What that means is that the working class is not a natural or innate class. The universe, the, the, the working class is an excessive, non-historical class that emerges through the inequalities that are structurally embedded within capitalism as such that are retroactively framed as the universal condition of participation by which everybody is free to sell their own labor. This means that the realization of class consciousness is precisely the realization that the working class is not a natural class because without the exploitation of the working class, there would be no insistence on the universal equality of capitalism. Every self-help guru already preaches this essentially by saying, don't believe that we live in a meritocracy, believe in a world whereby everybody has to work for themselves. Of course, the particularly symptomatic form in which this is itself part of capitalism is the ideology that is presented to you by which you have to pull yourself up by your own bootstraps instead of realizing the collective necessity of the impossibility of everyone doing so. Hence, from the Marxist perspective, to argue that you are a universal come particular is that the recognition that the working class is therefore a constitutive exception within the so-called universal participatory frame of capitalism is precisely how the working class embraces its true universality. True universality in metaphysical code, Plato, is therefore the idea of a universal that doesn't succumb to its own exception, namely the idea of a pure universal, which in Marxist terms is therefore communism. The metaphysical argument underlying the idea of communism is precisely not simply the po political collective, but the positing of a utopia, a place of no place in which there is no necessary part of no part that underlies the false symptomatic universality of seemingly neutral participation in the collective society. I realize I'm like talking too fast and too complicated here, but that's an aside for those of you who are interested. Now, I was recently watching the TV show Succession, and there's this wonderful scene in Succession. Essentially, we have two families that are juxtaposed. We have on the one hand, the family of Logan Roy, sort of modeled upon the Murdoch family that essentially gives the people exactly what the people thinks it wants, which is a kind of like the lowest common denominator of news and prejudice and paranoia and fear versus the upper class um, billionaire family that owns the liberal media and the liberal newspapers. We see essentially these two families which are juxtaposed. And here we see again the, the, uh, the world of politesse. Every time there's a bidding war that takes place with the liberal newspaper owners, the, the woman who is the billionaire magnate who oversees this family pretends like she hates bidding wars, like she hates talking about money. Of course, this is the fundamental middle class, upper middle class gesture par excellence, which is a refusal to speak about money. We are above talking about money. It's not what one does, as if talking about money were thereby something vulgar. And of course, in order to insist that you don't talk about money requires having enough money to not have to talk about money. That most people who speak about money or think about money or lay up at night worrying about money aren't people who want to do so, but have to do so by necessity. In other words, that part of the very framework in which the civic obligation of not speaking about money is made manifest is precisely the underlying symptomatic universal by which this class, the moneyed class, can pretend to not care about money precisely because all they care about is making more money. There's a beautiful scene where the two families are negotiating and she has this, and, and the, the, the liberal billionaire something says something like, well, what are numbers anyway? I don't know, I don't understand numbers. Seven, eight, nine. Of course, she's referring to billions, the billions of dollars that will be offered to her. And this feigned ignorance about the nature of money and the dirty business of making deals is precisely the symptomatic obfuscation that makes this liberal part of the politically correct money-owning class. We are better than you because whilst we engage in the exact same cutthroat media and financial tactics to enrich ourselves, we do it with a human face. And that has always been the leftist critique of liberalism, that it fundamentally mirrors and mimics all of the predatory policies of the right, except it does it with a civic mask, with a 
more human face. If you look at American politics, for example, essentially many of the policies that the Obama administration had and that the Biden administration had are simply the continuations of Trump policies and before that George W. Bush Republican policies. The continuation of the same policy except with a human face. Therefore, liberalism, rather than presenting itself as the antithesis to right-wing reactionary politics, is simply the continuation of the exact same thing, but with a more civic mask by which we emphasize virtues such as the common good and humanity and politesse and politeness and everybody getting along. Hence also why the insistence on civility, for example, in parliament or in Congress usually underlies a status quo or a consensus by which certain things are off the table that cannot be discussed. Now, it's interesting here to juxtapose the reactionary framing mechanism, which is to promise a revolution by which everything ordinary, by which everything stays the same. Like drain the swamp is the perfect example of a reactionary political framing mechanism. Let's drain the swamp, but we're also the biggest swamp monsters. The revolution that is posited, not to change anything, but to fundamentally keep everything the same, is therefore the right-wing political gesture. The liberal gesture, the alternative to this, is to say, let's not change anything because we want to protect the status quo as the normative framework of consensus by which we find the middle ground, a win-win solution. There's a beautiful Chinese expression about this, which is like a joke that circulates amongst like Chinese scholars, which is that, uh, the Chinese conception of a win-win situation is by the one by which China wins twice and the U.S. wins zero times, right? The win-win is thereby not divided between two parties, which of course always relies upon a hegemonic framing mechanism by which retroactively one side pretends to be the equal of the other. An example I can give you is like Brexit, for example. In the Brexit negotiations, the European Union got almost everything it wanted from the United Kingdom except the European Union tacitly agreed that the United Kingdom would retroactively present the Brexit negotiations and the deal under Boris Johnson as a victory. In other words, it was a total victory for the European Union. I mean, a victory is, of course, a sad state of affairs because no one wins here. But the UK didn't get what it wanted, but presented itself as having been victorious, by which it gave all the things like fishing rights and the Northern Sea, etc., to the European Union. Here we have the Chinese win-win. It's a, it's, it's, a, a, it's a win for the Europeans. Uh, sorry, not the Chinese. Here we have the liberal technocratic consensual win-win. A win for the Europeans in material realistic form and a win for the United Kingdom's conservative government because they can present it as being a victory. This technocratic insistence on consensus that you present a equal opportunity by which both, both parties have won therefore is a symptomatic universal that always underlies a hedge my position by which one party was the stronger who could therefore insist on the terms by which the agreement was being framed. Hence, every time we have a moment of consensus in politics, what we really have is not an agreement between two parties, but a, an existence of a temporary power dynamic by which one group is sufficiently powerful to insist that an agreement has been reached equanimally, or whatever the word is, on an, equin, equ, equinomal, on an equal basis. You could say the same thing, for example, when it comes to the uh, thousand years of peace, the Pax Augusta, not the, thou the thousand years, the, the Pax Augusta. I'll, I'll get to the thousand years in a moment. The Pax Augusta, which is the longest era of peace within the Roman Empire, was, of course, not a peaceful era. In fact, it was the beginning and the continuation of the end of the Roman Republic. The beginning of the non-democratic Roman existence was therefore presented retroactively as the longest period of peace. And clearly there were many skirmishes and there were even wars that were fought under this imperial banner. And yet they were not presented as being sufficiently antithetical to the Roman Empire as to be worthy of being an infraction of the peace. And you can see co contemporary continuations of this. Like in the 1970s, the Dutch fought wars of aggression within the colonies, Dutch colonies, like Indonesia, which they didn't call wars, they called them politional actions. Think about how Russia doesn't call the war in Ukraine a war, although recently they've actually embraced this, which is a very interesting transition from the idea of a po police action into a full-fledged war. Therefore, to have the power to insist that your act of aggression is not a form of warfare is, of course, a hegemonic retroactive positioning by which you have claimed the superiority to declare or frame what the conflict is. 
Here again, we have a symptomatic universality. The Pax Augusta, the peaceful reign of the Augustian Empire, is therefore a peace in name only, which signals to you that that the empire was sufficiently powerful as to be able to frame an unpeaceful period as being a form of peace. There were no genuine challenges to this hegemonic framework. Now, the reason that I brought up the thousand years is, of course, this was part of the ideological play of uh, World War II under the Nazi ideology, which was that das tausendjährige Reich, that the Nazi rule was supposed to be the continuation of a thousand-year rule going back to the Augustinian Empire, but crucially also extending forward a thousand years into the future. In other words, the positing of a kind of timeless, universal, German, Teutonic, empire identity was precisely the symptomatic universal under which the crimes of World War II and Nazi ideology were committed. Of course, for those of you who have watched my other classes, you will already start to understand that the positing of a false universal antithesis or enemy, namely the Jew, capital J, Jew, was thereby precisely the ideologically determined necessity, the other side of the coin that was required to uphold the symptomatic universal of the thousand year Reich. Why is the thousand year Reich not been more successful? Well, it's because of the figure of the universal enemy of the Jew. And here we see this, again, the reactionary framing, which is the positing of a revolution, namely everything will change in order for it to stay the same, requires the universalization of an other into a scapegoating enemy that you can then take advantage of, something which we see today in today's politics as well. Now, to bring this back to politesse, to bring this back to the idea that all civic participation is therefore the, a free act, which is a feigned obligation, namely I'm choosing to participate, but I'm pretending like I have to, we can start seeing how this filling in, this unity of opposites between freedom and necessity works within the symbolic order as such. Namely, if the symbolic order is structured by an empty place, namely the big other doesn't exist, the empty place of power, it's precisely because this place is empty that it is materially constitutive or filled in. It's precisely because the crown means nothing that it is filled in through the institutional necessity of the power structures that inform it. Many societies that are monarchies today, like for example, the Dutch, because we talk too much about the UK, the Dutch insist, and this is the perfect bourgeois ideological uh, retroactive framing of the necessity of the monarchy, the argument made by realists, by the middle class participants in the monarchy in Holland who nevertheless see themselves as Republicans, Republicans as an anti-monarchy, is that it is a economic virtue to have a monarch. In other words, that the monarchy has a financial benefit to the country, which outweighs the antiquated, unnecessary, um, like ceremonial garb of the institution. In other words, here we have the perfect example of civic participation, a free act of participation that is presented as an obligation. Namely, I don't believe in this, but I'm participating anyway because I have an ideological reason to do so. Namely, I don't really believe in the monarch. I don't really believe in the idea of divine inheritance. And after all, who today really believes in the idea that the king is the representative of God? But I believe that it is valuable, that it is a good economic proposition to have a monarch. In other words, it's easier to make economic deals and trade deals because you have the representative view of your monarchy, which makes it easier, therefore, to work with other societies that have monarchs, etc. I believe that there's an economic benefit to having a monarch. Therefore, I will pretend to believe in the monarch. I will be a loyal Dutch citizen to the crown because I believe on behalf of economic necessity. And the argument here is that this is how all power works. It's never the naive embrace of the true authority of the leader or the monarch or the president. It's always the feigned participation of believing on behalf of an ideological supplement that allows you to keep on believing. It's a very interesting thing, for example, that used to happen when journalists would go to like Trump rallies is 
Many of the people at the Trump rally said, I'm not really here for Trump. I'm not a big Trump believer, but I'm here because I'm curious about all the other true believers. And this is, of course, precisely how belief happens. It's always on behalf of the other that you are believing. I am at the Trump rally to see why everybody else is at the Trump rally. In a sense, it's the inverse reaction of what happened, uh, for example, during COVID or any other kind of disaster when people start mass hoarding toilet paper. The argument isn't, I believe that we are going to run out of toilet paper. The argument is, what if everybody else thinks that we're going to run out of toilet paper? Well, then I should probably buy toilet paper in case they do too. Thereby, we've all collectively participated in a false belief, what existentialists classically would have called mauvaise foi, um, false consciousness, which is all of a sudden we're all hoarding toilet paper, even though none of us really think there's a necessity for hoarding toilet paper, except by means of this false participation, now there is a real necessity for hoarding toilet paper momentarily at least. This collective frenzy is how all belief functions, which isn't to say that it's false, it's to say that it's true precisely because you believe in it, you inhabit it falsely. Therefore, from a Hegelian dialectical perspective, true and false and freedom and necessity is a unity of opposites. It's not that freedom is the uh, 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 getting rid of all necessity, it's that freedom is the proper embrace of necessity. And vice versa, civic obligation, which is the underlying framework by which this realization of freedom as necessity can occur, is the inverse of it, which is the participation through a free act in what presents itself to you as a necessity, as, of course, I had to do this. Now, what we're leading to here is part of Zizek's theory of Hegel. And I'm going to wrap up very quickly, which is to say that Zizek links this idea of freedom and necessity Back to the Lacanian bard subject. Now, the Lacanian bard subject is a concept that I can simplify for you here real quick, which is that for Lacan, the principle of the subject is never to say, here I am, true self, me. Once I've worked through all of my issues, all my trauma and all the triggers and all the things that make me not act authentically, I will find my authentic being or self-expression. In other words, the self is not the pot of gold at the rainbow right at the end of the rainbow. It's not, once I've worked through everything, I will be happy and authentic. Instead, from the perspective of the barred subject, the subject doesn't exist without this tension. In other words, the very idea of subjectivity is a retroactive illusion presented to you by the impossibility of embracing your authentic self. This means that subjectivity is a kind of mirage that occurs to you in the desert of your own being. And that in a weird way, this is what Lacan calls the fundamental fantasy, that the more you hold on to the idea that you could rid yourself of all the barriers towards subjectivity to embrace true subjectivity, this is of course itself the ultimate subjective illusion. Therefore, to traverse the fundamental fantasy for Lacan is to realize the unity of opposites or the necessity of contingency by which subjectivity is the filling in of the impossible gap between the true subjective and the not true subjective experience. That subjectivity is simply the retroactive necessity of embracing the impurity of your own being as your own subjective truth. Hence also why Zizek then uses this idea to make an argument about the critique of ideology. If for Lacan, the idea of a, non, of a, a pure subject is impossible. Authentic subjectivity is thereby a subjective illusion that emerges precisely with an impure subjectivity. The same is true for ideology. That the positing of a non-ideological pure space is of course itself always the most ideological expression. That for Zizek, pure ideology is therefore everything that presents itself as an escape from ideology. Hence to traverse the fundamental fantasy for Lacan is to say, Embrace your mask. You are your own mask. Or for Zizek, enjoy your symptom. Your symptom, namely the, irre the irreducible reality by which you cannot escape that which you believe to be detractive of your own pure, authentic subjectivity, is your own subjectivity, is for Zizek therefore a political manifesto. If, therefore, any escape from ideology, any positing that you can be the individual lone wolf master who pulls yourself up from your bootstraps, etc. If this escape from the system is how the system is perpetuated, 
Therefore, the only true way to resist is to resist from within the ideology itself. In other words, to insist on the arbitrary structure of ideology so that through an act of resistance, which is always there for an act of imagination, a new structural mechanism of coercion can be posited. In other words, freedom is never simply freedom from, but it is to say, let us reconceive of the manner in which subjective freedom emerges as a necessity. To put that a little bit less abstract, what Zizek is therefore arguing is that freedom whether it's like communist freedom or utopia or whatever, is never simply resistance to, since resistance to is already baked into the very fundamental logic by which, within, by which within capitalism you are presented as your own free master. As I said before, Marx's quip is that it is only within capitalism that you are free, except only free to sell your own labor. That the antithesis to this, therefore, is the realization that freedom and the, the experience of freedom today is underlined by an invisible structural mechanism of guiding principles and rules that determine the horizon through which this freedom can be enacted. Therefore, if you want to truly be free, if you want to create a true act of resistance, it's never to do more free things or to be free in a different way, to be more expressive or start more blogs or write more things or go to more protests, but it's to examine the invisible structural mechanisms of oppression that lie underneath that we take for granted each and every day because we think that we are so free. In other words, Zizek's argument thereby is that we should always resist the hermeneutic temptation. The hermeneutic temptation is to simply interpret the content of reality that presents itself to us. In other words, to put it in terms of freedom, to resist the temptation to say, I am free to do what? Free to buy more shampoos, free to watch more movies, free to go to more countries, and instead to examine the implicit, unspoken rules and regulations that lie underneath the horizon of this freedom. Namely, resisting the hermeneutic interpretive mechanism, the temptation to simply focus on the real freedoms and instead inquire into what are the pre-existing conditions and regulation and mores and rules and unspoken, uh, 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 I don't know, unspoken necessities of participation and change those. Because if we change those, we can change the imagination by which what is dictated as free can be dictated as necessary and possible. In other words, Zizek's act of resistance, to put it in very like, blanket contemporary terms is not to focus on oppression, but to focus on structural oppression or structural inequality. But the flip side for Zizek is therefore not simply to focus on freedom, but to focus on structural unfreedom. Namely, the horizon, the underlying preconditions, the, 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 the systemic ways in which we are unfree in order to conceptualize what we think of as a free act. And therefore, every act of resistance is an act of imagination to say, what is it that I think I can do? What is it that I can justify? That to be a revolutionary isn't simply to burn things down, but to have the audacity to insist on a broader horizon of human experience and existence. That is what it is. It is an audacious act of reimagining the horizon of what is possible. That is what Zizek conceives of as the necessity underlying the philosophical inquiry into the nature of freedom and the Hegelian unity of opposites between the idea of freedom as feigned necessity and freedom as embraced necessity. That's what I've tried to cover today. I know it's a lot, um, but this is part of a longer series that I'm hosting. So you can join me every Monday, every Monday, 8 to 9 a.m. USA Pacific time. Uh, I'm currently on the road in New York City right now, but soon I'll be back in Washington. Thank you so much for watching. And please, if you enjoy these classes and if you are able to do so, I would very much appreciate a financial donation to keep this project open access for everybody. My dream is to make philosophy and theory and psychoanalysis available to as many people as possible around the world. I truly, truly believe in the power of collective communal education. Thank you so much for supporting me. And if you can and are willing to become a patron, every little bit makes a huge difference in keeping this project alive. Thank you guys so much. And if you'd like to support me, please go to www.patreon.com forward slash Jeneline and Julian. Thank you guys so much. And I will see you next week. 
Plus, for patrons, we're going to be starting the Q&A live on Discord, which I will post as a podcast for patrons in about 10 minutes. Thank you guys so much, and I will see you next week.